I knew I was going to, so I went down and enlisted for two reasons. I got to the school of my choice, and I got a 120-day delay. I just got done spending a year rebuilding Harley Davidson, so I shipped my Harley Davidson to Florida for four months and enjoyed myself before I went. Oh yeah, that was, that was, first of all, the reason I took that delay and got to the school of my choice, I went in it to the recruiter, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, really. But he said, well, you build Harleys and you're mechanical inclined, so he got started to talk about mechanical things. And they showed me a, the trucks and the motor pool, and those diesels bored me. And He turned the page and showed me a picture of the Cobra. I said, that's it, just that quick. And so, Glenn arrived at Fort Campo in 1969 after his 120-day delay after enlisting. Oh, when you land, when you get to Fort Campo and I get you're getting off the bus. Get off my bus, you little guy. Get off. You knew it instantly. Instantly. Little Booger is one of the nicer ones. <laughs> there, Glenn and other young, courageous soldiers went through the eight weeks of basic training where they were stressed to their physical, mental, and emotional limits. This was necessary to prepare them for the conditions of Vietnam and the war they would be put through. This is very physical, very hard. No stuff, the rifle part was fun, the shooting range and all that was fun, but the rest of it was just all PT and you know, food was terrible. But. Once done with basic, Glenn was sent to the advanced individual training where he would be put through the mentally enduring process of learning excessive knowledge on the AH-1G Cobra helicopter. No big deal. You know. It really wasn't, it was just do your job, you know. Bas basic was crazy, but then I went to AIT, to Cobra School, and I enjoyed that because I was learning about the aircraft. That part I liked, you know. Well, <clears throat> when you finish AIT, you go check on the board, and it's almost like if you made the football team or something. This, the, this line was Vietnam, and there was a line for Germany, and you just went up to see which one you were in. And I happened to be on the one on the left. After his official assignment to Vietnam, Glenn headed home for his goodbyes before heading over to South Vietnam. You don't know. You don't know. The first thing you notice when they open up the door the plane, you walk out, you can't breathe because it's so humid. I mean, it's literally you can't breathe because you got to get used to it. It's just like sucking air. You couldn't suck air, you know. It was so humid. Glenn was mostly stationed at the Phuc Binh military base in Vietnam. There, he and other mechanics took care of the 9th Cavalry's assorted aircraft, including Cobras, Hueys, and Loaches. Well, was, first of all, it was mainly maintenance. But all day long you're rearming. The aircraft would come in, you'd reload the rockets and the guns and refuel, and then we had nine birds, so three or four made on the ground getting the maintenance. Then we did maintenance at night. So you were working 16, 18 hour days, basically. Rearming and doing all that during the day and then pulling the minor maintenance at night. So at night, but first light was at 4.30 in the morning, so you get to bed by about 11 and you're up at 4.30. The pilots come out to inspect the aircraft before they leave, and you have to be out there and open the doors and check everything yourself and then everything open for them to check everything and then lock it up and set them off. You know, you got to untie the blade and then you stand out there while he cranks it up, 
clear, clear, coming hot, and just, then they'd take off. And with so many hours spent maintaining and caring for the aircraft, the specifics and details of the Cobra will always stay with Glenn. Bad machine, though. I don't know if you know anything about it, but that in, the, in the nose there's a, a minigun, it's basically a Gatling gun. Shoots two, two trigger switches, 2,000 rounds a minute or 4,000. Like a Gatling, it's basically an old Gatling. Uh, that's the one half, and the other half is a chunker that shoots 40 millimeter, equivalent to a hand grenade, shoot 240 of those a minute. That's just in the turret. Then you got 38 rockets on the wings. Oh, it's, it's amazing, man. It's unbelievable. That's one aircraft. 38 of those 17 pound rockets. And you punch them off, they go whoosh, 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 whoosh. That's, I think it's some of that VHS that has some shooting in there. We should, we should have a lot of rockets, believe me. A lot of rockets. We, we had this little motorized, it's like a little flat thing in the back with a little cage with a driver that sits up front. We need to have that thing piled like this and go through that seven, eight times a day. Each aircraft takes 38 of them. And you got four aircraft flying and they're going to make four trips. You know, that's a lot of rockets. We had a gun guy, no, you just, mini gun was just belts, like a Gatling gun. It was just a belt, you just hooked a belt up. The chunker was the same thing, a bigger belt. And the rockets, you just slide them in. Slide them in, they click, and that's it. And the pilot can punch off two pair, three pair, four pair, and it, all it is is a little igniter. And so all you had to do was slide them in and click. We used to have fun with the new guys. These rockets are about this long, with a 17-pound warhead. And you gotta take them out of the tube and stack them up on a cart, a little wheel cart, motorized cart, and take them down to that line and put them in the aircraft. The new guys come in, you know, Act real careful for about 10, 15 minutes and you throw them <laughs> The same thing though, they don't arm until they spin. So we used to have so much fun with all the new guys doing that. They did it to me, so we did it to everybody else. But foolish tricks weren't the only thing these soldiers did to keep occupied. Some would personalize their aircraft with names and emblems. Eh, it, was, it was basically from the old Flying Tigers from World War II. You know, we just started horsing around and everybody had them. There's other units that had them, but they were ugly. You know, like shark's teeth. Nah, nah, nah. See, all my buddies were naming their aircraft after their girlfriends. You see all the other ones in the book, they're all named Cindy Ann and all. No. <laughs> mine's, mine's after some kind of music. Uh, you know, it's, every guy's different, you know, you know, some did and some didn't, some did, but it's just their job, you know. It really was it all, it was your job, but, you know, it's, it's like your baby, you know, and that's all you got to do, you know. That's all you got to do, that's your baby, man, that's it. You know, you, you obviously, when you do a major maintenance, you help each other, you know, like, it might be three guys working on an aircraft, but my aircraft is my aircraft. This belongs to me, you know, it's Uncle Sam's, but for now, it's mine, you know. The second one is this. Take care of it, you know. I didn't love it like this one. You know, this was my baby. Because <laughs> it was the oldest one out of the nine. It was the oldest one. It was the only one that didn't have air conditioning, which is another reason the captains didn't like flying it, so they'd try to red exit. But even in the middle of a war, Glenn was able to enjoy his experience in Vietnam. You know, especially this many years later, all you're going to remember is the good stuff. You don't remember all that. You, don't, you, know, you put that stuff out of your mind. You remember your buddies and, you know. Actually, I didn't mind it over there that bad. It was, you just do your job, everything was good. Nobody bothered you. One of my favorite memories, I 
up, you know, the tail rotor is about 16 feet in the air and you got to change the oil chip detector. I'm up on a three-legged ladder doing this. And this, this Huey comes in right next to us and blowing dirt all over the place. Just, and I got this gearbox open. I got so mad I went down, I ran to the aircraft, opened his door and started screaming at him with all kinds of language. And I walked back and he got out and he's a full colonel. I said, holy <laughs> shit. I thought I was, I'm serious, I thought I was going to jail. I'm, you wouldn't believe the language, because it just made me so damn mad, you know. These things are so technical. And about two hours later, he comes walking back down from the talk, and I see him coming. I said, oh, Jesus Christ, here we go. He says, I apologize for my pilot for doing that to you. I said, oh, God. I swear to God, I thought I was going to jail. I, mean, I cussed this full colonel out like you can't imagine. Because when they're wearing their fight vest, you can't see their grade, you know. I saw him get out, I said, oh, Jesus. That was fun after the fact, I know. <laughs> and although Glenn spent very little time flying a Cobra, it is one of his favorite memories. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I say, if you're in a tandem seat and you sit in the front, and you're surrounded by plastic, you feel like you're sitting in the end of a two by 12 out in the middle of nowhere. It's cool. You're booking down the river at about 120 knots, five feet off the water, doing this, oh man. Roller coasters, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> And his time spent in Vietnam wasn't a solo mission. Him and his squad mates went through the war together, and they would spend their time together even long after the war. Oh, I, my two best buddies ever were other crew chiefs. You know, they left before I did because they were there before me. They taught me the ropes and all that. And they moved on, and new guys come in and make new friends. You know, it's a rotating thing. You know, but my two best buddies, I finally. It took me 29 years. We had a reunion and we met up 29 years later in the year 2000 in D.C. That was fun. Now we stay in contact all the time. After 29 years, now we're staying. And my pilot, my pilot sends me stuff. He sent me that in the mail. And, you know, he sent me a, a skin from a cobra that says the crystal ship on it. He sends me all kinds of stuff. So my pilot. Although most time was spent working with the aircraft, these young men were still able to appreciate what they had, even in the middle of a war. Like I say, when we're out there, we're just shooting, you know. But back in, when the guys around, you play a little catch and, you know, horse around. You know. Pretty much you were busy all day. And like I say, pole maintenance all night with flashlights and everything. And we actually had a hooch. We had a bunker, pretty good size, about the quarter side of his room. It was all sandbag. So these rockets come in boxes. The tubes are in these boxes. So me and my buddy took all the wood from the boxes and built a little room in there. We had our own little room. We built it ourselves out of, out of the rocket boxes. So we had our own little privacy inside the bunker. So we didn't have to worry about anything. Everybody else, we get every night we get income and they come pouring in the bunker. <laughs> we did, we built the floor, the walls, everything. Out of boxes from the rockets. Stained it with tarp paper and JP4 as jet fuel. You soak the tarp paper in the jet fuel for a couple days and you take it out, it's stained, stained the walls with it. That's the fun, that's the stuff we did in our spare time. You know, the birds are up, we just, you gotta stay busy, you gotta do something. So, hey, let's build a room in the, in the bunker. Everybody was jealous. I got pictures of all the warrant officers coming over our area, <laughs> and they'd bring beer with them. Come on, let's go. But the pressure and constant feeling of war bearing down on them made it difficult to relax or truly enjoy their time. So, many used controversial ways to distress. Oh yeah. To be honest with you, yeah. Just pot, you know. So some guys got into heroin stuff. That was very rare, you know, but pretty much everybody smoked that, honestly. Not massive quantities, but, you know. It was a different world then. These soldiers were but still young men being thrown into the middle of the war, and de-stressing allowed them to cope with the missions at hand. We were one of the very few units of Vietnam that actually did search and destroy, called a pink team. You got the little loaches buzzing at treetops, either trying to draw fire or look for the enemy, and they got the Cobras circling above. If they draw any kind of fire or anything, they get out and the Cobras roll in. Most Cobras over there were, they're gunships, that's all there is, gunships. They're only 36 inches wide with all the weapons. Most of them were just, when you call in for help, they come and help you. But we actually did search and rescue. I'm search and destroy.
can, they were trying to you know, catch them bringing in armament stuff across the border, you know. In fact, we were five miles from the border and we had a, I had a little outpost that I got stuck on a mile from the border. And all I did was sit out there and rearm the birds when they came back out in the middle of nowhere. Me and an armament guy, just two guys sitting out there. The purpose of this outpost was to resupply the aircraft that was trying to stop the incoming supplies of weapons and soldiers from the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The danger of having the outpost so close to the border was a possibility of enemy forces overrunning it. Oh yeah, the one, the one time we had nothing but connexes of ammunition and rockets and, and bladders of fuel. They were taking off and they were circling and we were wondering what the heck's going on because they're circling, getting up elevation when they're shooting right over our head. We found out that the battalion of NVA was a quarter of a mile away, and there's two guys sitting out there. That's when you get scared when you see the bird shooting right over your head, like, wait a minute, you know, there's something going on over there. And just you and an arm of a guy, and we, you'd be so scared, we had an M60 out there in our M16s, we'd just shoot all day to make it sound like there were more people there than two. <laughs> That's true. Just sit out there and shoot our mission, so I think there's 20 guys there instead of two. These risky moves and many others that were taken during the Vietnam War were all for the safety of the South Vietnamese during the communist takeover. And although many soldiers did not interact with the locals, they knew their purpose and importance to them. I had no problem with them. So just, that's why we're there, to help them, you know. We didn't see much of them because, you know, we're in forts or out in the bush, you know, we didn't really see a whole lot, for the most part, you know, like the mama sounds come in and at our laundry and all that, so we're fine. But sadly, not all of the local South Vietnamese were understanding or appreciative of the United States efforts to help and wanted a union with the communist North Vietnamese. These people fought against every U.S. action meant to maintain South Vietnam as a democratic nation. These soldiers were known as the Viet Cong. Well, yeah, anybody's shooting at an American, I'm not going to like them, you know. And it they were the worst because they would be in your area all day long and then at night they'd come out with their black on and slit your throat, you know what I mean? You couldn't tell who was who. That's how different than that war and the other wars. The other wars you had a front line, you pushed lines forward and back. This war it was just, there was no line, it was everywhere. So you don't know who was who. These people living in the villages, they might be cutting rice all day and all that, but at night they go out and they're part of the Kong, but you don't know it. They, you know, they don't wear badges and hats and, you know. Sneaky, that's why I don't like them, they're sneaky. And it was the mission of the 9th Cavalry to search and eliminate both the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers. Destroy missions were made up of three parts. The first part was made up the little birds. Those guys I tell you are the crazy ones, the little bird guys. <laughs> they were the warmongers, they were crazy, they loved it. Buzzing treetops. Sanging up the side when I'm sick, but they loved it. Also, more widely known as loaches, these aircrafts were the scouts of the mission. Their goal was to draw or seek out the enemy's location throughout dense forest-covered trails. Yeah, they did. They loved it. That's I can never figure it out, but. I told you, they offered us one day. We lost two birds in a day. So that's six guys. If you want to fly lift for a day, you get two days off. One day off was like heaven. We'd give you two days off if you'd fly a little bird for a day. No, thank you. I'm staying with my Cobra. I'm crazy, but I'm not that crazy. Next was the red team. The Red Team was the muscle power of the search and destroy missions. The Red Team's aircraft of choice was the AH-1G Cobra helicopter. These Cobras were just newly introduced within the Vietnam era and were extremely powerful with two 7.62 millimeter miniguns and two M129 40 millimeter grenade launchers. Also, the Cobras had great air mobility to help support the ground units in the fight within the dangerous terrain that is the Vietnam landscape. Once the scouts got out of the danger zone and the enemy's location was known, the Cobras would roll in and fire on their target. Without the Cobras, the mission of keeping threats out of South Vietnam would have been extremely difficult. So, it was imperative for the mechanics to keep the birds in the air.
Lastly, there was the blue team. The blue team is broken down into a few parts. First is the infantry. The infantry are the soldiers who would set up the perimeter in case of a downed aircraft. These soldiers had to be prepared and aware of their surroundings because of the possibility of enemies hiding within the dense forest around them. Then, once the area was secure, the lift crew would advance into the site of the crash and would inspect the wreck. Once it was deemed safe to lift, the wreck would be fastened up and carried away by another aircraft and would be taken back to base. Although there was never a want for the lift team, there was always a need. All wars have casualties. The Vietnam War was no exception. The North Vietnamese soldiers had anti-aircraft weapon being brought in through the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and this is why it was so important for these search and destroy missions to be successful. But war doesn't always go as planned. Sometimes, the Viet Cong were able to acquire anti-aircraft weapons, and the aircraft would get shot down. But not only were the aircraft lost in these crashes, also the brave men who flew them. An estimated 58,193 soldiers were killed in Vietnam, and many of these fallen soldiers were only in their early 20s. Many of the casualties came from aircraft-related incidents. An estimated 8,569 soldiers died from aircraft crashes. Within the war, it was only a matter of time before something was to go wrong. Then, one day, when the crew of the Crystal Ship were out on a mission, they were attacked by enemy forces, and the Crystal Ship was shot down, killing the two crew members. Uh, and my, my aircraft I had for nine months got shot down. And so I had to take over another aircraft, but that was my baby, the Crystal Ship. So that was the scaredest 24 hours of my life, because I, I didn't know it got shot down, I just knew it went down. So I was worried it was a mechanical thing, something I did freaked me out basically till I found out it was shot down and you know it's still sick but it made me feel a little better because I thought it might have been a mechanical so these things are so precise it's the slightest little thing you know that's what freaked me out the most One thing I remember is getting an airplane full of, with, you know, an airplane's got normally like 200 seats in it. It's had little tiny, it's a, a regular aircraft, but it squeezed in another 40 seats to get like 300 guys in there. You know, you're sitting like this all the way back. That and when I got to San Francisco. But we're, we're coming back, we're sitting in the San Francisco airport for a couple hours. People are calling you a baby killer and warmonger. And, hey, we're, I got drafted, man. I'm just doing my job, you know. I would have got drafted. We're just doing our job. And I called people in San Francisco walking down the hallway. Baby killers, war pigs, a lot worse than that. No ticker tapes, I, guess I would say. But leaving the country, yeah, you take the opposite of that deep breath you took when you got there. You get on that top of that step and you just look back and whew, let's go. Adios. And when Glenn was asked what advice to give to us students, his answer truly inspired and motivated me not only to work on the project, but to carry with me throughout the rest of my life. Yeah, okay. find what you love and do it well. Because you're not going to do it well unless you love it. I don't care what it is. I taught all my kids. My one son's a guitar player in a band. The other one's in Hollywood making movies. One's a carpenter. He's a coach. Do what you love and love to do it, otherwise you're never going to be good at it. you got to find that thing that clicks your switch. It might take a while, but you find that, like I'm a carpenter. I've been doing this for 40 years, but I still get up every morning loving what I do. That's the important thing. I'm serious. You got to find what you love to do, otherwise it's work. You know, work can be fun if, if you enjoy doing it. I don't care if you're a teacher, I don't care what you do, a mechanic, whatever, just enjoy it. And be the best you can be at it. You're not going to be the best you can be at something you don't like. So you got to find a thing that flips your switch, whether it's a guitar, or coaching, or carpenter, 
My youngest daughter is a school psychologist in a high school. So that's what she loves. So just find what you like and do it well. That's all I can tell you. You might not notice it overnight, but when it comes, you'll know. I really love doing this. You know? Then it's not work anymore. This life-changing event all started with the panic dart in my eyes, panning across the seemingly endless list of names, names that I knew all had wonderful stories to tell, stories of love, fear, courage, meaning. Each name had a story to tell, and I was to only pick one. And what felt like an eternity, standing over the screen, trying to find something, anything, that would make a name stand out, it happened, a connection. The name Glenn McCloy and a description reading Cobra Mechanic got my attention. So this whole year, this whole experience began. This is the most memorable experience in my life so far and will truly be with me the rest of my life. And it's all possible due to various reasons. But the most important one is you, Glenn. You gave your time to tell your story. But what you didn't know is what your story would do to a young, eager student, what it would do for me. Sure, that's what this program is all about, creating a story that captures the life of somebody. But to truly experience it and be a part of it, to understand the things that will never be able to be captured by camera or be put into expressible words, it's truly unbelievable. It has no other words that can describe it other than me telling you and hoping these words will create an understanding for the connection that is created through this program. I thank you not only for your time serving, but for your time living, experiencing, and undoubtedly sharing your life, a life that I will never be able to truly live for myself, but be able to share with the world. Glenn, you can put a big smile on your face and crack a joke about this whole experience, which never fails to put a smile on me or anyone who comes to know you. That's, that's, I always sound like an old man, don't I? You know why? Because I am. 